Hello everyone, and welcome back to Dark Souls 2. We rejoined Varam at the base of Hyde, ready to make our way through to No Man's Wharf to claim both of our permanent weapons for the playthrough. Right now it's just a matter of dealing with the Hyde Knights. Depending upon whether you're hitting them through their shield or hitting them straight on, it'll be a two or three hit kill at this point with this weapon. This one's always a bit tricky because of how his swings come out. They're a bit hard to predict. Goodness, I'm taking a lot of early damage. Let's let's fix that. Grab the sublime bone dust that he's going to drop because that'll really help out our Estus once we grab that. It's not quite as noticeable as it was in Dark Souls 1, but it's still a very valuable addition. Depending upon how you walk, you can actually get him to throw himself off the edge for you. Oh, thought he was going to carry himself that last little bit, but no such luck. I guess we'll dispatch him the old-fashioned way. You see, he really should have fallen there. Once you kill all of them, I'm going to want to pull the uh, platforms up just because there's no point in keeping the small arena. It's going to take about two seconds to pull both levers, and the fight's just that much easier once you have the full area to stand on. You can't get knocked off. Bait him out alone. Don't want to fight him with any of his companions. Two quick swings. Since I have so much damage, I'm not going to bother luring this one alone because I know I can kill him before the other one would come to reinforce. And now I can just kill this last one all by his lonesome. Wait for him to whiff his combo. Two quick strikes and he's down for the count. Once you have to clear all three, you can raise the final platform, and the Dragon Rider is going to be no problem because he can't even knock us off into the drink. That's his only real method of killing the player if you're playing careful. And now that we've brought up both platforms, it's just a matter of time before he goes down. I want to grab the green blossoms before I head over there just because they're nice to have on certain boss fights, Smelter Demon in particular. I want as much stamina as possible, though the weapons I've chosen will make short work of them if applied correctly. The only threatening move from these greatsword users is that spinning slash that he brought out at the end there, and so long as you back off or make sure to position yourself correctly, it's not going to be an issue. First Dragon Rider, sprint right up past him, and now we unlock combat. Oh, took a free swing there, but... Ah, oh, goodness, I tried walking into him instead of sidling around, and he punished me for it. Bounce off the shield, and here we are. That's the right angle. I have to get right behind him in order to make that work. Oh, oh goodness. I am not rolling properly today. Let's see if we can... There we go. I do have enough adaptability to at least get some iframes, so it's... Not like I should be missing these rolls consistently. Finish him off. Normally I wouldn't rest at the bonfire, but because I've already wasted two Estus playing a bit sloppy, I am. And I'll just clear a few extra old knights on my way over to Dragon Rider. Always come over here, tag the bonfire, and you want to talk to Lycia before you do anything else. I, I if you're planning on getting m any miracles, now is the time, but I don't have anything worthwhile from her, so... Just talk to her until you get the rooking, the uh, gullible natives, and then you can rest the bonfire and head about your merry way. I have no particular reason to kill the old dragon slayer, other than just the soul count I'm going to get from him, but I honestly think that's enough of a reason. I've got most of the weapons I'm going to want for the playthrough down pat, so any souls I get are going to go straight into levels, and the stronger I can get early game... I personally think the better. Come on over here to this little three-way. Once again, because I have the damage to take him out so quickly, I don't have to worry about uh, luring him away to face alone. Walk outside the sweep of him. It's always nice to grab these bits of loot in case you're planning on going into the covenant of the uh, blue sentinels or want to be uninfusing certain weapons that you would get throughout the playthrough. Because they have a chance of dropping Palestone, 
which is actually fairly rare, at least from... Oh, thought I was just out of range of that, but alas and alack. It's fairly rare from lizards themselves, so you kind of have to be careful about where you're getting it from if you actually want any real amount of it. They can also drop their armor and weapons, but they're pretty piss poor, especially because their durability is so low. Both their shield and their weapon are going to break before you get any real use out of them, and their armor is just really heavy and not all that worthwhile. You can get some much better stuff really early, like the knight set on the way to No Man's Wharf, or the elite knight set that you can buy from Mullen once you've upgraded his inventory. Not to mention the Drang Lake set that you get for free, so... It's just a kind of worthless bit of armor. The only thing I could see it being used for is fashion souls, like saying you're making an early giant dad build. That's one of the better armors for that. This is a pretty cool animation. As some people have pointed out, the chains still shake a bit, even once the drawbridge is down, and that is a really nice touch. Gives it a sense of weight, and once it's finally resting there, just a little bit of finality as the chains sag. Grab the Ring of Binding, which, honestly, I haven't used since my second playthrough, just because I prefer to spend my entire time fully human now. They removed the uh, price you had to pay for that, so why not just stay full human and fashion souls it up the entire game? Walk it away. It's kind of strange that he has dark attacks, but... Eh. I don't think too much about it. It's been confirmed by the devs that this is just fan service. It's not anything lore related. This isn't Ornstein. It's just they know that he was a popular character from Dark Souls 1, so they brought back his model in different armor and gave him a similar moveset, but with dark instead of lightning. He still gives you the Leo ring, which is a really good ring if you're planning on doing any sorts of pierce builds for counter damage, but and you can still get the old Dragon Slayer Spear, which is a bit better in this game than it was in the last game, in my honest opinion, just because good spears are pretty hard to come by. But I, I still don't really like his inclusion in this game. It just feels like pandering, and I don't want that. Probably not going to use either the shield or the mask, but they are pretty good looking pieces of armor and that tower shield is one of the better great shields around so might as well have it just in case come over here head over to Medjula before I go on down to No Man's Wharf just because I've got a lot of souls to spend and I don't want anything happening to those even if nothing's likely going to happen it's always better safe than sorry still haven't come across any deaths just yet so that's heartening Let's see get my strength all the way up to 40 right off the bat. That sounds like a great idea. Start raising up my other combat stats and I'm ready to head out. There we are. Head over to Hyde's Tower of Flame. No connection to Flame God Flan, of course. That, that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> I tease, but it is certainly interesting that this place bears such a striking resemblance to an Orlando, and also is has its own Tower of Flame, considering one of the only characters that we know left Anne Orlando is Flan, the God of Flame, who uh, eloped with Guinevere at the end of the Age of Fire in Dark Souls 1, so it's just something to note, something to pay attention to. Really, I can... I pretty sure I can actually get a one-shot kill on the great sword wielding ones if I make sure to use a strong attack. Yeah, definitely going to be a one-shot once I come across any others. I don't remember if there are any others, though. There may be one or two down the waters below, but I can't remember. Grab the night set, as I was talking about earlier. Some really nice pieces of early armor. It's not quite as good as the Elite Knight set, but uh, it has different poison defensive values. I prefer the Elite Knight set for PvE just because it looks better and you don't really need high poise for clearing PvE. Clear it on through. 
through. They do have a chance of dropping green blossoms, which is pretty nice. You don't get a whole lot of stamina, stamina recovery items very early on in the game. Like, it takes forever to get the Archdrake shield, and the Blossom shield is much, much further in the game as well. So, Blossoms and the Chloranthi ring are your only real options. As well as reducing your equip weight if that's something you're into, but I would prefer to Fashion Souls it up with the Falcon armor. Which is one of my favorite sets of armor, by the way. It looks really cool. It's got that mix between cloth and heavy armor feel to it, and not too light, not too heavy. It's a very middle-of-the-road armor set that's very balanced for early game. It's not quite... doesn't quite cut the mustard for late game outside of Fashion Souls, but I'm definitely a huge fan. Really glad that they included a bunch of more cloth armors in this game, especially with the inclusion of the cloth physics. And the fact that it's the starting armor of the knights is just another reason to pick that class. It's already one of the most superior class in that if you're not going to be a spellcaster, it has the minimum points dedicated to Int and Faith as any other. And while it does have, let me check, yeah, two extra points into Attunement versus the Bandit, it also starts with the three base intelligence needed to use uh, straight as a merchant, so it is, I would say, a superior class because it is a bit more balanced, it has better starting equipment, and it's, again, one of the classes that can use the homunculus mace right out of the bat with just a single level up. Once you get to Majula, you can have the homunculus mace and be ready to start smashing your way across Drang Lake. The other good thing is that it starts with a lot of vigor, so you're not going to be in a very risky place early game. Whereas some of the other base classes really don't give you a whole lot of health to work with. Any sorts of slight mistakes can really mess you up. But the knight is, not again, not only starting with really good armor, but starting with good vigor, it's just a very, very strong class to start the game with. Oh, oops. Let's try that again. Uh, not quite enough to one-shot. And if I could get my rolls down, that would be a lot better, but I was just playing a little bit of PvP with one of my uh, late-game builds, so I got a little bit used to the higher adaptability. It's always a little bit of an adjustment coming from a late-game character to an early-game character, but it's no big deal. Juke out the arrows. So long as you're walking in a different direction than you're actually headed when they fire the arrow, it should go completely askew and not even be a, a worry. Come on down and grab the loot. This is a bit of an interesting ambush in that if you're trying to just rush through the level, he can actually land on top of you, stagger you, and get a bunch of extra free damage. And that's just something I kind of want to avoid. Oh. That was almost a dangerous position there. No matter. There's a few dark resins in here, which are your best source of early dark damage, since you can't get any other sorts of dark damage until you either infuse something or talk to... What do call it? Falcon the Hexer over in Huntsman's Cops, and maybe grab the Dark Scythe out of the Shaded Wood. It's not terribly useful versus bosses, as they have pretty generic resistances to almost every sort of damage, but it is nice in PvP, especially early PvP, if you get that bit of extra dark damage, because not a lot of people are itemizing against that so early. There's very few ways to get a good amount of dark defense early game, and so if you can use one of those as opposed to just some other resin, you'll be doing just that little bit of extra damage, which can always be the little bit of extra damage that makes the difference. Hopefully, I can get a one-shot on a backstab versus these guys. They always give me a little bit of trouble, especially in numbers, but... Yeah, so that's good. I can get the one-shot, so... They are going to be a bit easier than they might otherwise be. They do have a really annoying combo in that if they hit you with the first attack, their second attack is almost a guaranteed hit. But 
depending upon what move they open up with, these monstrous creatures here can actually open themselves wide up for a backstab, so circling around is generally your best idea, at least in small numbers. I'm gonna try and see if I can just aggro one of these two. There are two on the ground level and two in the floors above, and if you can get just one of them to aggro, you can get the backstab that I believe is so useful for this as them. And if not, you can get ganged up on and bled to death. Not that you're not gonna bleed either way, but it's far more likely when you've got several of them coming in. They did remove some of the iframes with backstabs, but not all of them, so you still have a very fair chance of making through without taking any damage, especially if they're coming in a bit after you've already started the backstab. Most of your iframes come into effect at the very end. And yeah, that was a pretty effective player of these guys. Usually they give me a bit more trouble, but only took like two or three attacks from them, so I'm pretty happy with that. Good old Gavlan over here. He, he wheels, he deals. That whole rigmarole. You can actually see a big lantern out there behind him. That's a little lantern that can be activated from a Ferris Lockstone a little bit earlier in the level. And it will drive all of those monstrous creatures indoors because they are actually very afraid of light. Any sort of fire or cast light spell will send them running. And you can use that to bypass most of the areas they're in. It won't last forever, as after a time they kind of pluck up the courage to come after you anyways, but it's a great way to run past if you don't intend on clearing them or grabbing anything from the areas they're guarding. Come on over here quick, Rangian. He opens up with a quick strike, so it's just another Estus down the hole, but it's not going to be too bad. I've got plenty of life gems for this early on in the playthrough, and honestly, the Craftsman Hammer is one of the most ideal weapons to clear this area with because it has a whopping 80 durability. And so, even in this really long level, it's not likely to break unlike most lighter weapons. Especially some dex weapons like falcons or daggers. They just simply are not going to make it through this level intact. And so you're either going to need to waste a repair powder or have backup weapons for when they start failing you. Really strong metal weapons like this craftsman hammer just are so much more effective in long distance levels like this. The great thing about this guy is that you can knock him back into that poison pot and just not have to deal with him at all even if you can't get a one-shot. Waste a throwing knife to get seven more. Definitely a worthwhile trade. There's a light Titanite lizard behind here that, if I could attack correctly, would die in a single strike because this Craftsman Hammer, while unupgraded, has a very, very large di amount of damage just already in the playthrough. It's, like I said, one of the stronger weapons you can grab for the early game. There are a few others, like, again, great sword class weapons and whatnot, but for its size and speed, it has just a ridiculous amount of DPS, especially because it doesn't take up too much stamina, unlike other larger weapons. Come on over in here. I've already got my large titan out of there, and there's going to be one more in here, and that's going to boost our total all the way up to seven, which is going to mean once I get my bandit axe and craftsman hammer, I can actually upgrade them to plus six and plus four respectively. Not the craftsman hammer, but the blacksmith's hammer. And once I have that, I'm going to be pretty set to beat most of the... Oh, goodness. I definitely want to unlock the shortcut just in case I come into an unfortunate end later in the area. But yeah, once I have my bandit axe and blacksmith's hammer, this character is just going to be in an extremely strong position to clear through. Uh, I guess I didn't finish uh, what's her face? Lucatiel's dialogues because I don't see her sign down there. And normally you would if you actually had her available as a summon. I want to be really careful there because I don't want to destroy that chest. It's got within it a free repair powder which would normally be the best way to handle your weapon in this level, but since my blacksmith's hammer, my craftsman hammer, goodness, I keep mixing up the two, has so much durability, it's actually not going to be necessary, and I can save it for later in the game. 
depending on how much noise you make in that upper encounter, these enemies will wake up and cause a little bit more trouble to you than if you'd come across them sleeping. As if they've woken, if they've woken up, then you can only get one free kill before the rest are at attention, as opposed to two you could normally grab. Come out here. There should be one Varangian out here somewhere. No? Okay, then. This is the Ferris Lockstone that will turn on the lantern that we saw up above there. I can't quite see where it is from here, but it's unimportant. I'm not going to waste it. Grab that soul and the Silky Stone. It's just nice to have, and since we already unlocked the shortcut, it's going to be a very quick run back. At this point in the level, it's just a bit of, like I said, housekeeping, just like in Majula, because there's only about six or seven enemies left, and it's a pretty straight shot to the boss once you've cleared through this area. One thing that I really like is that they also give you the ability to completely skip the pair of monsters down there, and since they're almost guaranteed to aggro at you both at once, it's really nice that you can just drop down here and not have to deal with them at all. If you can get the proper angle for an early hit, you can knock them off before they come up. And I'm just trying to see if I can get that, but apparently not. It doesn't want to give me the right angle for it. Come down here, quickly slaughter him. Grab that little item, and I'm not going to bother with Carillion the Mage over on the alternate pier, just because I don't have enough intelligence for him to treat me like anything, and I don't really want to be insulted, so the only options for him are ignore him or kill him, and it's just not worth the effort at this point. He gives you a very paltry amount of souls, and it's just not really worth it. It's a bit of a wasted effort, especially because his spells might be a little bit dangerous to me this early. Run up and get a very quick kill, and if you're fast enough, you can actually manipulate the two Varangians that are coming over there to come at you at different times, so that you can just dispatch them one by one, as opposed to dealing with two of them charging your face all at once. I'm not going to kill that archer just yet because I remember there was a drop here. Bringing cuffs, those are some of my favored gloves just because they look really cool with a wide variety of armor sets and they're extremely light so if you're trying to really budget your weight capacity they can fit with a lot of really good armor sets and just look cool all the while. That's the full clear through the No Man's Wharf and now we come to the Flexile Sentry didn't even have to waste our last Estus before we got here, so we're in a really good spot to take him out without an issue. The roll timing on that move is a little bit wonky, and he does a very large step forward for his follow-up slash, so you really have to be very careful about that, but if you can get around him and make his melee side focus on you, his melee side, his blunt side focus on you, it's a lot easier of a fight. And if you can stagger him, it's even easier. One strong attack should kill him at this point, so just wait for him to whiff. I, oh, okay, maybe it won't. I really don't want to put myself at any risk, and since he's at one tick, let's just throw a knife him. No point in showing off. Come on through. No, ladder's up there. And a lot of people miss this, even on later new game cycles, and... There's a little pyromancy flame here with a fireball, just for those of you who want it. And I am going to grab it just because if I am going to be doing any casting late game, I'm going to want it to be pyromancy, just because I don't want to have to put too many points into either intelligence or faith to get hexes, sorceries, and miracles. So pyromancy is just the way to go, because the only real stat you need to upgrade is attunement. Depending upon your playstyle, you could actually go with the dark pyromancy flame that you can get down in the gutter, but I don't personally rate that just because I like to remain human all the time. I think it looks better. I like the fashion souls aspect, and the hollow models in this game just really don't recommend themselves to me. In Dark Souls 1, they were pretty okay, but they they kind of made you more like a zombie-looking creature in this game, as opposed to the sort of undead hollow look that I really liked from Dark Souls 1. Trigger that elevator on my way out so that I can get all the loot from this area before continuing on. 
it's just another repair powder and I believe a scimitar but it's nice to have especially because on longer levels like this you can see how low my craftsman hammer has been brought and since I believe the blacksmith's hammer actually has a little bit less durability I'm gonna wanna have that just in case especially because the bandit axe is nowhere near as durable let's have a look see yeah it only has 50 that's a whole 30 off and if I'd been using that it would have broken long ago so the more repair powder you have the better it just allows you to keep going on the longer levels and while there aren't that many it's particularly good to have on the ones that you do it's one of those things where you might not always need it but you always want to have it because it's better to need it and have it I mean it's better to not need it and have it than not have it and need it now we've gone full circle and we're at the back of the Lost Bastille. I'm going to head over to Majula and upgrade my Bandit Axe. And after that we're going to head on to the Ruined Sentinels. I don't want to take this back way around the uh, Lost Bastille just yet. I like to save that area for making a run through and grabbing a bunch of secrets. Upgrade the SS Flash Shard. And I believe I also have that first Sublime Bone Dust from the one mace wielding hollow, oh, not hollow, but old knight over in hide, so I'm gonna wanna use that as well. Spend a pair of souls, but I do want some left over so that I can upgrade my equipment. I've got my bandit axe, and that's going to do us very well. Because it was buffed in the most recent patch, it's got a lot more base damage, which it that base damage increase actually doubles once it's reached max rank as well as I believe the scaling is already pretty good I actually crunch the numbers and fully upgrading that to plus six spends about five thousand souls with Lenagrast and since you need to spend eight thousand souls with him before he will allow you to grab his blacksmith hammer without killing him I still have a few points to a few souls that I need to give him and I'm just debating on how to set that up. I'd considered actually just sacrificing myself with a uh, ring of life protection but to get that like last little 3000 but I thought better of it because I'm still deathless and I want to hold on to that for just as long as possible so kinda gotta be sparing with my titanite because I don't want to use too much of it. Let's see, does that, is that enough? Yeah, there we go. Now I've got my blacksmith's hammer and I can start upgrading that as well. After just two upgrades, it's already surpassed the craftsman hammer, at least in terms of base damages, and I believe its final scaling comes very similarly to the craftsman hammer, so that's not going to be that big of a deal. Let's actually just compare the two since I've got them here. Yeah, their scaling is already extremely similar, and the Bandit Axe has a bit of an unfair advantage in that it has a pair of extra upgrades, so they're going to be extremely similar damage uh, weapons as I progress through the playthrough, so it's really only going to matter whether I want blunt damage, slashing damage, or which move scent I'm really going to want. I personally think that the Bandit Axe plus six is the ideal weapon for these Ruin Sentinels, because uh, it, it really just cuts them down so fast, especially if you're using a weapon buff, which I intend to, because the faster you kill them, the better. A little bit off on the timing there. Just because they are really so strong, and it is kind of a bit of a race. The best idea is to take them all out while you're still on that beginning platform. That way they kind of come to you one at a time, and you can... <laughs> you can kind of manage them whereas if you try and jump down and fight them all down below they can come at you in much greater numbers and from many more directions so it gets a little bit more difficult to juggle their aggro mm. I think I aggroed all five at once and I don't want that but huh? it's looking fairly okay right now oh, I was really hoping that strong attack would get the kill but let's save our weapon durability Turns out I didn't aggro the three from over there, so they can come at me now. Oh.
I always say weapon durability if you have the opportunity. There's no point in wasting it, and it can come in handy later. Oh, goodness. These last two. Oh, I forgot to upgrade my Estus Flask. Oh well. I should have enough to make it through the fight without an issue. This is where the two-handed axe moveset comes in. It has very broad sweeping attacks that really hit a lot of enemies at once, and it's very useful for when they're clustered up like that. I'm going to want to grab the two drops here before I head on in and have my aromatic ooze equipped, just for that little bit of extra damage. You'll see how effective that is once I actually get into the fight and start absolutely shredding the health bar of the Ruin Sentinels. Because I have such a very focused strength build already at uh, the soft cap for strength scaling, and I already have a plus six weapon, this fight is really going to be a piece of cake. The only difficulties are going to be managing when exactly they come up to meet me and how I drop down, because that is a sizable chunk off your health bar if you don't have the silver cat ring just yet. Oh, look at that. Positively sickening. Oh, rolled a bit early on that. Shouldn't matter, because that's the kill shot. Estus that up, and just wait casually for him to come up here. Her. I don't know. I kind of assume they're female, just because of their names. Alessia sounds very feminine, but I guess I can't know for certain. Maybe they actually say in one of the uh, trades for their souls, like with straight or something, but I can't rightly know. And that's the kill. I am going to want to drop down just so I have uh, that more, much more area to kite, but now that there's only one left, it's the fight's basically over. come on around behind. Always want to stay as far behind them as possible because that's where their moveset is least effective as you can quite clearly see. The whole fight goes off without a hitch. And I know there's no items behind this secret door but I always have to activate it just because. Again, secret doors are my weakness. I have to get every single secret door I possibly can. There's just something about that secret hunting that really appeals to my sensibilities as a gamer. It's really satisfying, and I always have to go after that if at all possible. Go in here and grab this. I actually forget what this is, but it probably doesn't speak too well to its use. Yeah, it's a target shield. I'm never gonna use that in this playthrough. At this point, I'm pretty much set to clear through most of the Lost Bastille and head on to the Lost Center. If I'm lucky, I may actually be able to beat her first try as well. The only difficult part about the Lost Center is going to be the uh, run-up and managing my less-than-ideal iframes during the fight. Aside from that, I can't really see too much going wrong, because, again, my weapons are extremely powerful for this area of the game and should do far more damage than is really necessary to have a pretty fair fight versus her get the rouge water. At this point it's basically just a uh, healing item because I'm not going to have anything to attune for it so it's a little bit wasted on me. I could grab the large club from down below along with the chime but I don't plan on using either of those because obviously I've got this very focused playthrough set up and so it's kind of just going to distract me from the weapons that I want to be using. I kind of want to stick within the theme, at least for now. Something else that I think it really works well about the Falconer armor is the really crimson red look of it. It fits so perfectly with if you're playing any sort of character that's supposed to be really rabid and warlike. It's kind of like the early game version of Vengarl's set. And so, since I'm cosplaying as far as I am, I think it's extremely fitting. Everything about the uh, base class of Knight just works so well. Come on down here. There's no loot in that little staircase there, so everything you want from this side can be accessed just by coming around. Going up the ladder. I'm going to want to trigger the uh, 
pair of gates here before I kill the unstable hollow behind me, just because they take so long. The first gate has to completely pull up before the second gate will rise, and it just takes forever. It It is nice because it allows you to really get the feel of, oh, look what's coming, but I'm... I don't really need that because I'm so familiar with the game. I already know what the next encounter is going to be, so that little bit of a teaser there is just a waste of my time. I just want to kill those two. He drops down. And those are all the enemies that I'm going to be facing in this area before I grab this pair of secret walls. The one sad part about this little secret over here is that it's a one-way secret. You can't really come back from it, but it's not that important if you don't really want it. It's a bracing ring as well as goodness, I th whatever that drop over there is, and a strong magic shield for those of you who are playing through the game early and are having difficulties with certain spellcasters, either in PvP or... Hmm. I don't actually think there are any early PvE spellcasters. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, I don't believe there are this golden wing shield. It's got one of the higher stabilities and physical, I mean not physical, but magic defenses for most of the shields in the game. Come on through here to just use this bonfire to warp over to the exile holding cells. And now we're gonna make our way all the way over to the Sinner's Rise, the Salt Fort bonfire. Come on out. There is going to be a high knight here, and while he only drops his spear, I am going to want to kill him anyways. I'm not going to use the spear, but it's a fair chunk of souls, and it's a little bit of unique loot that I might want if I ever decide to change up this character. As is my favorite way of dealing with them. Knock them up first so you can get a free backstab, as well as you can damage them on the ground while they're in their backstab. At least while they're coming up that first little bit. Good his item, hide spear, as I said. There's gonna be a small bit of loot if you come around here. Depending upon whether you have the silver cat ring, this is a pretty good place to use it, but I don't, so I'm just gonna have to tank through it with my large vigor. You wanna kill the dogs before you face the warden that drops down, just because they can they can sort of mess you up a little, just because their attacks come out really fast and once their attack animation starts and they're on course, you're pretty much going to take the damage, even if you kill them before they reach you. Just because of how broken their hitbox is, the damage from their attack comes out no matter what, even if you kill them. There are a few enemies that are like that, and dogs just seem to be the real big offender. Whether it's these undead dogs here in the Lost Bastille, or it's the horrible abomination dogs found in the gutter and all the keep. The dogs in this game just have very unfair hitboxes. Hitboxes and animations, I guess. Because it's not just one, it's how fast in their animation that it comes out. Some of the other really terrible offenders are the spiders over in Brightstone Cove, but if you deal with them at a pretty fair range, it's not as much of an issue. The really horrible thing about the dogs is that they have that lunging attack that closes distance almost immediately. So no matter what, you're pretty much just going to take the damage. Here through here. This is why we wanted that antiquated key from the Tower Apart bonfire in the Lost Bastille. Because that allows us to come through here. Make my way away. And get all four kills. I am going to knock this down and trigger this ambush. It's a completely optional fight, but the enemies that it brings up aren't that difficult. And I like the armor set that they drop. The Wanderer set is one of my favorite armor sets from Dark Souls 1, and while it's not quite as cool looking in this game, especially because of the different helmets that you can equip with it, I still want it just because it's a little bit of nostalgia, and it, again, fits into my collectionist theme. Hmm? Really, game? <laughs> not going to give this to me? There we are. Oh. If you don't get him before he climbs up there, it can just be a little bit of a waste of everyone's time waiting for him to uh, climb all the way up and drop down because you can't actually backstab him out of the ladder and 
most of the places you can stand while there are going to end up with the ladder giving you a backstab. Here's one of the places where you can use a firebomb to unlock a little secret wall. It's holding the Archdrake robes and shield, and while the Archdrake robes are just the starting armor of the clerics, the Archdrake shield is actually pretty good because it's one of the lighter shields that you can get with a decent physical block. It actually starts out all the way up with 95% physical block and 50, what should we call it, 50 stability, which is extremely high for an early game shield, and it's a whole two weight lighter than the Drang Lake shield, so if you're not extremely worried about that little bit of chip damage, it can be a much better option, even though it has slightly less stability and damage reduction. It's still a very worthwhile shield for anyone trying to do a shield playthrough and don't necessarily have the weight to allow for the Drang Lake shield. Here's my first soul vessel because they kind of jipped me out of the one in Majula. I'm, wor I'm wondering about what they actually plan on doing with that mystery chest after this mystery event's over because well, I, I really like the idea of getting a strange random bit of loot really early game. I don't know if it's really worth giving up that early soul vessel, especially because that's going to be the first soul vessel available to anybody who's really new to the game. And making sure that newbies don't screw themselves out of a good build just right off the bat is seems like a pretty good design decision, and I'm just a bit leery of them removing that. Because I don't have too many more enemies to fight before I reach the next bonfire, I'm going to Estus on both of these drops. I'm pretty sure I could have survived both at once, but I wanted to be safe, especially because I've got a bit more weight than I'm used to for this area of the game. Most of the time I'd have a lot lighter armor and weapons. And so, since your weight actually affects the fall damage you take, you want to be extra careful if you're playing a heavier set character on little drops like that this point it's just these two left before I can make my way out this portcullis and over to the bonfire. Break out the two-handed moveset just to quick clear around this corner. It's just a bunch of life gems and oh, even more life gems. Who knew? It actually takes us almost up to 50 so we've got a fairly large amount for this playthrough. I know I haven't been using them but I haven't really needed to been doing really well so far, and as I said, I still haven't died, so it's pretty clear that my Estus has just been doing it for me this whole time. Gonna, yes, wait for him to drop down. They're really nice about this. The archers up there will drop down on your first entrance into this area and give you a chance to kill them without having to face their firing squad of crossbows or later on. Sometimes they get a little bit stuck, but it'll be okay. There's only two of them left, so that's already a third of their damage output taken out. And since you can almost always dodge one of them at the very least, that is a whole 50% of the shots that would be hitting you removed from the equation. I'm going to be a bit, little bit tricky because I haven't upgraded my Estus Flask yet, and I'm going to want to do that before I take on the Lost Sinner. So instead of heading straight back to Anjula, I'm going to come down here and grab the second, um, oh, normally you can get a backstab on him, but apparently he was already aggroed to me. Grab the second Sublime Bone Dust before I start upgrading my Estus, just because I want to be able to handle all that one time so that I miss as little of it as possible. Because, again, I am completely notorious for forgetting to do that, as you've clearly established by now. Let's this up just because the next enemy is a little bit tricky, especially because I don't have a very strong backstabbing weapon. The axe is pretty okay, it's just not the best for backstabs. For that you really want a sort of thrust type weapon, be it a dagger or a halberd or just some other really strong dex weapon. Certain clubs also do the job extremely well, but I'm not going with any of that right now, and I'm pretty sure the axe will do a little bit more than my blacksmith's hammer. Get the early quick hit. 
Yeah, if I get a single hit in the backstab, that's the kill shot. And, you know, since I still have an Estus last, left, let's at least try and clear the other two enhanced undead that are down here. Ooh. Wait for him to get the second swing. Oh, oh dear. This could be bad. Yeah, that spinning attack is the attack that you do not want them to use because it's extremely tricky to roll through. Oh dear. I am going to life gem just because I'm already kind of dedicated to grabbing this bit of loot and all it's going to take is a single backstab to kill this guy. Ah, keep taking that. There we go. There's just one more and then I can homeward bone out and head to Majula to set up my Estus Flash. But again, I'm kind of dedicated at this point because if I was going to grab the item over there... Or is there an item up there? I believe there is. Pretty sure there's at least three that are hidden behind these guys. I may be wrong. Looks like I totally am. But it's not going to matter much because I can get the backstab and hit him as he's standing up for the kill. So, a little bit wasted time, but time to homeward bone on out. I don't want to bother with the rest of them just yet. and It's unimportant to raise the portcullis just yet because... Clearing through them after you've skipped the first set of Enhanced Undead isn't really an issue. You've got to be really quick about tagging the bonfire here because all that line of three crossbowmen are all just waiting to peg you the moment you pop back up. As you can see, I also have a ridiculous amount of souls that I need to stick into my character somewhere. Let's get my vigor up. Lots of more endurance. And let's make sure we've got a little bit of vitality as well. That should set us up really nicely for this next fight. And... Oh! Yeah, upgrade the Estus Flask with the one that I grabbed behind the Macduff bonfire. See, I know his name. I just kind of messed it up last time. Now I get to burn both of my Sublime Bone Dusts, and I'm in a really great spot to be facing the Lost Sinner. Especially because it's not New Game Plus, she doesn't have those pyromancers. So long as you're effective with your rolls, it's a pretty easy fight. It's just circle around, wait for her to whiff, to roll behind her if she's getting a little close for comfort, and just make sure that you keep your health high. That's as best as you can do, and if you keep all that in mind, fighting unlocked or without lighting up the braziers isn't that much of a challenge. You can't actually just completely ignore them if you are pretty sure that you're just going to be heading straight on to the boss. So I'm not going to bother at all. This guy's kind of blocking the doorway, so I like to get the free backstab. But it's unnecessary. As long as you walk in a strange circle like that, they've got a very nice chance of missing because of the predictive AI in this game. Walking around in circles and unpredictable directions is a great way to throw that off. As such, if you're pulling off that strategy, then the only direction they can actually be aiming to hit you is if you're walking either directly away from them or directly towards them at the time that they decide to fire. Because otherwise they're going to predict that you're going to head off in a tangential line and completely whiff their arrow. Or, I suppose it's a bolt because they're crossbows, but... It's the projectile that's really important. Come on over here. You want to spend as little time as possible in the water just because you travel so much slower and it really bogs you down when you need to be pretty agile to take on most of these guys. You want to come at them as quick as possible. Always get the first hit, otherwise they're going to explode and really chunk you hard. There's only four once you cleared out those three that are on the stairs. And so, after I clear this last one, I will be completely safe and ready to take on the Lost Sinner. As you can see, I've already got my Aromatic Ooze equipped because I fully intend to buff this fight. Again, any extra damage I can have is going to be that much shorter that the fight lasts. And so, it'll be really, really important in making sure that I spend as little time as possible in the danger zone. I could also green blossom, but, you know, I suppose there's no downside. I've already got seven, so 
that little bit of extra stamina is really going to help as well, especially because I've already got the Chloranthi ring. All of those little factors are going to add up and really set me up in a nice position to have a good clean fight this time around. Fingers crossed, and so we go. I really do love this opening. It really sets the tone for the fight. This is a penitent character who's just sitting there waiting to die, and yet she can't. A little chaos bug in her mask is clearly influencing her actions, and uh, it's just such a heart-wrenching character. I love everything about the Lost Sinner. She's honestly one of my favorite bosses out of all of the Souls games combined. So much about her character is just so great. The way they set up her lore, the really, really vague... Oh, God, I'm messing up my rolls. This is dangerous. Get the quick Estus off. She should give me time for that. Roll away. Yeah. It's all about risk-reward with her. Whether or not you can pull off the attacks and the rolls, I cannot. Goodness, I need her to give me an opening so I can heal again. Oh. Uh, okay. I was being a little bit cocky. Wasn't rolling quite right, and yeah, I ate it for that. <laughs> well, once more onto the breach. Oh, did I forget the elevator? Uh, pretty sure I did. Also, so much for that no death playthrough. Well, it was bound to happen sometime. I mean, this is Dark Souls. You really should be expecting to die, at least sometime. If you're going to try a no death run, the best idea is actually to skip as much content as possible and just clear through the game in as minimalist a fashion as you can. Because every second you spend in the game is one more chance you have of dying. Come on down here. Let me take one crossbow shot. and I'm not going to need all six Estus in the fight. So, And in fact, it's unlikely that I'd get the chance to use six Estus all within the same Lost Sinner fight. So we can just make a straight dash through and clear up that little health problem before we actually enter the, the uh, boss fight room. A little fog gate there at the end. This does give me a little bit of a chance to really explain what I love so much about the Lost Sinner as well. There's so much about this fight that just makes it feel so impactful. Whether it's the way that the Lost Sinner fights, those really hard-hitting, quick, fast moves that kind of leave her open, or it's how hunched and insectile they make her character model look. Everything about it just comes together to really convey this sense of despair and darkness, and it's just such a great fight. Well, I wanted to grab those souls before I rolled, but I didn't quite have the chance. As you can see, not being greedy actually gives you a much better chance of facing off against her properly. Rolled a bit early on that, but we're good. Circle round. You can see the damage that I output is pretty disgusting, like, for this early. But that's the power of a focused strength build. What's really great is, now that she's at low health, she's gonna fight in a far more hunched manner. I kind of want to give you a little demonstration before I kill her, but she doesn't look like she wants to. Hmm. Oh well. Maybe it takes a little bit more time in the fight, or maybe you need to handle her a certain way, but generally speaking, once she gets to below half health abouts, she will start fighting with her sword raised in a much more defensive position. While it doesn't actually change anything about the fight, it's sort of like Sif's limp, in that it really shows that they're worried about dying in the situation. She's doing her best just to save her own life at that point, and... It's just such a sad, sad state to see her in. It's not quite as emotional as Sif, but it really conveys the tone of the fight, I think. And there we have it. That's our first Great Soul of the Old One attained. And that gives us the first, uh, what should we call it, Fragrant Branch of Yore for the playthrough, which is really nice in that we could... We actually have three options of where to head now, just because we grabbed that one item. We could either head through the Shaded Woods, which is one of my more favorite areas of the playthrough. We could head through Huntsman's Copse, and 
I'm probably going to do that just because it's the intended path, I guess. It's more balanced for an earlier character. Or we could spend some consumable souls, grab the silver cat ring, and head down into the gutter. But honestly, I'm going to forestall that as long as possible just because I hate that place. Black Gulch is pretty okay just because uh, the gimmick of the poison statues is the only really threatening part, but uh, the gutter is just really annoying. I'm starting to learn to like it, but it still has those dogs that are just terrible, and because I'm a completionist and it's such a sprawling level, it takes at least two run-throughs in order to clear it all, and I really hate that mechanic. I like to be able to just grab everything of note in one solid run-through, and they just don't allow you to do that in the gutter. I want to make sure that I have my throwing knives equipped for this next area because it will allow me to take out the poison moths that are dotted throughout the area. Not to mention the first one that's going to come up as we head into the next tunnel. None of them are particularly dangerous, but they will give you a free poison moss every time you kill them and that's really useful for later on in the game. Old Falcon over there being a little bit emo. I have nothing to do with him on this character just because there's nothing he can offer me. He's just gonna insult me for not being dark enough for him and I'm gonna go on my merry way a little bit frustrated for being insulted by the NPCs. I hate exposing myself to that just because it's an NPC and it's insulting me. Come on. I could kill him if I wanted to. I'm not going to because it's a waste of time and I don't need his drop. But still, it's the, it's the it's the principle of the matter. I'm the player character. I'm infinitely better than any of the NPCs in this game and don't you try and challenge that by insulting me. Oh, with that. Come on in. There we are. That's good to see. Because this is such an upgraded axe, I can actually kill them with a single attack if I get the sweet spots. Which is really nice because you can end up facing quite a number of these enemies depending upon where you are on the level. Up to about four or five at once if you're particularly bad about aggroing them. Here's your first little token of fidelity in case you didn't have access to good online play and wanted to join the Blue Sentinels, but I kind of just grab it because it's treasure and it's there, as is my fashion. Come on over. Monastery Charm is one of the better items that you could get from this place, just because you're basically guaranteed to be poisoned at least once or twice throughout the game, and Monastery Charm heals you up as well as curing the poison. It's better than these poison moss in that it gives you a little bit of extra health as well, so saves you some Estus, and make sure that you don't... Oh, not going to give you the backstab? Now you will. Saves you that little bit of est Estus or Life Gem that you would have to waste to top yourself off after having a bit of poison. Rickard's Rapier isn't worthwhile on pretty much anybody, unless you really just want to abuse the poison system. Because each single attack from the special attacks on Rickard's Rapier will grant you a pretty sizable amount of poison buildup. If you get that pretty high, then a single combo is going to poison anybody under the sun who can be poisoned. That's the only... bleed as well, I suppose. But those are the only real uses I could see for Rickard's Rapier, just because it's so fragile and really doesn't have very good base damages at all. The only notable thing about it is its incredibly quick moveset. But, again, since it doesn't do much damage, that moveset's really only useful for proccing status effects. Grab all these. Sprinting attacks are nice just because they allow you to preempt the AI. If your attack would come out slower than their attack, it allows you to still get the first shot off because you, as a player, have a little bit of more predictive capacity than the AI does, at least outside of certain invader phantoms, which are admittedly rather cheap. They did set up the game to cheat in a way by reading your inputs on certain enemies, like Azlatil and a lot of the uh, 
enemies within the DLC, but I think it's at least a little bit fair in that you can still manipulate how you're playing your character to uh, befuddle the system and make sure you're getting your staggers and can lock the opponent out of combat. Grab all the early loot. It's nice to activate this shortcut even if you're gonna tag the bonfire just in case you have an invader and wanna have a few more options of where to run or if you're invading then it's always nice to have that down so that you can come up from earlier in the level as well. It's just a bit of courtesy for any sorts of PvP that you're going to be going into. Come on through here. These Torch Hollows, I kind of dislike them just because they've got a better chance to drop their torch than they do the Prisoner Set. And I like the Prisoner Set because it raises your drop chance, which as a loot whore is pretty, pretty important for me on most characters. I'm not going for Fashion Souls, I'm going to use uh, most of the Prisoner set or the Traveling Merchant set in order to get that little bit of extra drop chance. It is true that these guys can hit you behind your shield, but anybody who's playing with any sort of attention being paid to what's going on can avoid them and their damage very easily just by backpedaling. I think they have like one or two attacks total that can actually hit you even if you're just backpedaling at walking speed. So they're just a very non-threatening enemy. The only problem is when they gang up on you in numbers, either the black phantoms that you encounter in New Game Plus, or the ambush that you come across in the Harvest Valley. Those are the only times that they can actually give you a modicum of trouble. Did I kill the moth here? No, I want to make sure that I kill the moth just because trading a throwing knife for a poison moss is a very worthwhile trade. Poison moss are pretty expensive in this game because they also cure toxic and all sorts of sass elements like that, so they're a bit more expensive and a 50 soul tr throwing knife is a lot less worthwhile than a full-on poison moss. Just walk out of his damage. Again, so long as you're good at manipulating how and what direction you're walking, you can avoid most attacks in the entire game, to be honest. There are a few where that doesn't hold true, but they're few and far between, and even then you can just use your rolls. It's just nice to be able to kill enemies without wasting any extra stamina. Holding on to as much stamina for possible for damage or rolling in case of emergencies is how I prefer to play. and. Well, sometimes it screws me over because I either get overconfident in how I'm walking or it's just a matter of I wasn't really expecting them to swing in a certain way. I, I still like the play style and really would rather keep doing it. Honestly, I'm not going to go up there and clear the Undead Purgatory just because I have no use for that covenant on this character and... I really dislike the fight and the run-up. All the torturers all in a line and the executioner's chariot, nothing about that is particularly fun and I don't necessarily need anything from there either so it's just a little bit of a waste of time if I go up there. The only reason I could foresee going up there is if I wanted to use my bonfire aesthetic there and face the entire ordeal twice in order to get the chloranthi ring plus two and I, I don't think it's worth it. I'm going to get the plus one fairly soon because I'm going to be doing the Shaded Woods right after this. Well, at least after I clear all the way through the Iron Keep. And at that point, I can get the plus one ring for free. And there's not that much of a difference that I really need to worry about having plus one or plus two. Especially since this is only new game and most of the enemies aren't going to be particularly difficult. Merciless Reina is coming over. I always debate with myself whether it's Reina or Rowena, and I've never really come to a concise conclusion. I only recently, through trolling the wiki, uh, found out that she has a chance to drop that shield, and it's actually a particularly unique shield in that it actually has base fire damage in addition to its uh, regular damage that you could use when 
wielding it as a weapon. And while it's honestly a pretty rubbish shield in all other aspects, including the fact that it's supposed to be spell parry, but apparently has very difficult time of pulling that off, it's not really worthwhile, but it's just a really cool concept. I like little odds and ends and trinkets like that, and whether it's the warlock mask that she wears that you can get, or it's, as I said, that shield that she wields, I kind of just want it because it's a little bit of rare item, and having it gives me a little bit of satisfaction. It kind of tickles my fancy. Come in here, and always have some sort of ranged damage equipped, whether it's throwing knives, firebombs, or something, because your first goal should always be to take out the necromancer. Until you do that, killing the skeletons is an exercise in futility, as they're all just going to come back time after time. Once you've taken out the necromancer, it's pretty easy, but especially when you've got this strong of a weapon. But before that, it can be a little bit tricky. Also, there's archers in here that will also make your day just a living hell as you're trying to deal with the necromancer who's already shooting homing bolts at you. Which is fairly annoying. See ya, buddy. Some strange rogue just walked off the edge. It's always nice when you can abuse the AI to just kill the enemy for you, but it does seem a little bit silly at times. Like, especially in the Iron Keep, there's this one Alon Knight that you can get to walk off the edge every single time, and it's just hilarious to watch over and over again. Because he never learns. Every game you can cheese him in the exact same way. Get the kill. Oh. Walk away. Come in for the sweep. The two-handed axe moveset and the two-handed mace moveset are really just two of my favorite sorts of close-range attacks in the entire game, just because they have a very wide arc. You can use them to crowd control certain enemies, and they come out so quickly that you can really just lay on the damage, especially because both sets of weapons have a very fast and fast moveset and strong base damages, so it's really just some of my favorite weapons for any period in the game. I don't know if I've discussed it, but my favorite weapon completely just overall for killing bosses is the Mace of the Insolent that you can cast miracles and hexes with. Not only because it has that wonderful two-handed mace moveset, but if you've infused it dark, its damage is just so powerful, and you can use it to cast Scraps of Life, which is another really powerful AoE that will just shred the life bars of any bosses known to man. Particularly the Ancient Dragon it's useful for, because that's just a very long grading fight, and having a consistent AoE in that fight for when he's breathing fire in front of him is something that you definitely want, because almost every single tick is going to hit him. Come on through. I'm not going to bother resting at the bonfire, because I've got three SS, my weapon isn't really in breaking range, and the skeleton lords aren't that difficult of a fight. It's just a matter of taking them on one at a time, killing their adds before you kill another lord, uh, rinse repeat. Quick sprint, especially because you can backstab them. That's so rare for a boss, and it, again, it, it really trivializes the fight. For the time, you just need to kite while you wait for these skeletons to become vulnerable. Once they are, just walk around, killing them before they even get a chance to move. It's great. Sometimes they do get a chance to move, at which point you just kill them anyways, because they're weak enemies, and you have a wonderfully powerful weapon at this point in the game. At least you do if you're following my little route. They do really give you a lot of large titanite early game if you're willing to look for it, and I'm about to head into the Harvest Valley, which is going to give me my first chunk possible in the game, so... It's just a very, very powerful set of weapons that I'm going to get really quickly. Those armored skeletons are a little bit more difficult than the unarmored skeletons, and last we have the bone wheel skeletons, which 
everybody who saw them just cried when they saw them sprouting out of the ground, but... I mean, they had to come in somewhere. They are easily one of the most hated enemies in all of Dark Souls 1, and From Software would be remiss if they didn't give you more to hate in Dark Souls 2. Luckily, the only places they really come into play, they're pretty easy to take out before they become a threat, and they remove their infinite stagger abilities that they had in Dark Souls 1, but still, just the very sight of the Bone Wheel is enough to instill fear in the hearts of mankind at large. It's just not an enemy you want to deal with. I'm going to make it to the bonfire and uh, head back to Majula, spend some of my souls, and that really should be it for this episode. I've cleared through how many bosses at this point? Uh, both of the ones in Hyde, the Man's Wharf, the two from the Lost Bastille, and the Skeleton Lords. Wow. All the way through six bosses in a single episode. As you can see, this route that I'm taking that gets me these really early strong weapons is extremely powerful. It gives you just so much damage output, especially if you know how to apply it, that you can really just trivialize most of the early game. The only difficulties that I'm going to foresee are facing really large enemies with these short-range weapons, like Mastodons. Those guys are going to be a little bit more difficult because I'm going to have to really be careful about my range on them. No, no we don't need more Vigor. We need to get some more adaptability so I can start making these rolls properly. <laughs> I've been having a little bit of difficulty in this run, and I want to make sure that that's not an issue. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you all next time. Have a good day.